All right. Good morning, everybody. So welcome to week two of information literacy. Um, I'm glad to see so many of you came back. That means I didn't bore you too much last week. I appreciate you uh, taking the time to join me again. Um, and I have a lot of stuff to cover this week. And I want to just get started. Oops, let me just click on the right thing here. Okay, so this week, we, last week we talked a little bit about what misinformation and disinformation are. This week, we're going to talk a little bit more about why, it, why people do it. We'll talk a little bit about how it's created, and we will talk um, a little bit about why people share it, even those who didn't create it, um, whether they know that it's misinformation or not, and what um, leads them to take the steps that they do to perpetuate this stuff online and offline. Um, so I want to remind everybody that we do have some ground rules um, because we're going to do, I hope, a little more discussion today. So please um, be respectful. These are pretty standard ground rules. Um, we want to have good discussion. We're not trying to debate here. We're trying to share information and we want to be respectful of opposing views and uh, keep our discussion about ideas and not people. And another reminder, if you don't want to appear in the recording of this class, turn off your video feed before you ask a question or use the chat box. I want to start just briefly by addressing a couple of the questions that came up last week. You guys asked some good ones and I got sucked down a couple of rabbit holes learning some new things myself, um, particularly in this area of TikTok, which has um, been in the news. So this isn't super directly related to um, what we're talking about, but since somebody asked about it last week, I'm going to address it briefly. Um, and my question was, is this a true security risk or just a political football? And I think that the answer is a little of both. Um, it's hard to know for sure, but basically just for some background, TikTok is um, owned by ByteDance. It's a Chinese company and it provides short videos for its users. So video clips, basically. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm getting a little distracted here by some controls on my computer. Okay. Um, and so it's wildly popular with young people, particularly teenagers and 20 somethings. It is um, weird. I tried it out for the first time last week. I had seen it before, but I actually installed it on my phone. Um, it is so clearly designed to addict you to swiping. Uh, it's like playing a slot machine. You just keep want to want to keep swiping. Maybe the next one will be the good one. Um, but anyway, that's not relevant to the, the political discussion about it. The problem with TikTok is that it is owned by ByteDance, a Chinese company. ByteDance claims that all of its US user data is held on servers in the United States and in Singapore, but its terms of service say that data is still accessible to ByteDance. Um, and the reason that's a problem is China's 2017 national intelligence law requires organizations and citizens to, and I'm quoting here, support, assist, and cooperate with the state intelligence work. So in other words, if the Chinese government requested data from, from ByteDance, they would be legally required to provide it. And that is where the security, national security concern comes in for the United States and for other places around the world. It's the same kind of concern that led the United States to banning um, equipment from Huawei, which is a um, mobile device and a internet device manufacturer. Um, again, a Chinese company, so if the Chinese government asked for access to its information, it would be legally required to provide it. So that's why um, TikTok has been in the news. It was, as you probably heard, uh, President Trump issued an order banning TikTok and WeChat, which is another um, chat service from app stores in the United States and had threatened to shut them down completely. Um, and since then, there has been a deal that's still in the works, we don't quite understand it, for ByteDance to sell TikTok to Oracle, which is a United States company, with Walmart having a commerce interest in it. Uh, but the deal is complicated. It's, it's something like Oracle and Walmart take over 20% of the company right away, ByteDance retains a controlling interest in it until it moves over to being a public company, yada, yada, yada. It's very complicated. And we don't even know for sure if it's going to go through because ByteDance says it needs the permission of the Chinese government to go ahead with the deal. And it's not clear that China is going to give that permission. So um, it's, it's a long story. Is it truly a security risk? I mean, every social media company keeps personal data about you, Facebook, um, your Apple ID, your Twitter account, all of these things. The issue is this national security law in China that gives the Chinese government direct access to that data. 
Um, the, the federal government a while back had already banned federal employees from having TikTok on any devices that they use for work. Um, so there is a clear security concern there. Is it being a little bit overblown in the um, context of trade wars and other political issues? I think probably it is. Um, do most adults need TikTok? Probably not. I, I would like to encourage my teenager to get off of it as much as possible because it's really weird. So it's about all I have to say about it. I don't want to take up too much of our time. Um, anybody have any questions about TikTok though before I um, move on? Okay, so another question from one of our students um, this week, and I'm going to just quote from an email. A friend asked me if you would address the disinformation reported by mainstream media, specifically mentioning the Sandman lawsuit and um, against CNN and Representative Nunes' lawsuit against CNN. So uh, let's talk about these really briefly. Nick Sandman was a high school student from Covington Catholic High School. He was in Washington, D.C. as part of a school trip. And this photograph and a very short video clip about him blocking the access to a, a demonstrator on National in, or, uh, Indigenous Peoples Day made the news. Um, people picked this up. They looked at the smug expression on the kid's face. They looked at his hat. They looked at the fact that he was standing toe to toe with a Native American man and they made a really big deal out of it. And they, he was pretty much demonized in the press, uh, on social media, in, in the general public. This kid got a very bad reputation very quickly and so did his school. A later video came out showing more context in which the students from the school were actually just before this happened being harassed by um, members of the Black Hebrew Israelites, which is another uh, sort of more aggressive demonstration organization. That second video gave us a much fuzzier picture about what was going on here. Um, and, it, and it really changed the way that the public looked at this incident. Um, so in the, in the meantime, mainstream media, including CNN and, and Washington Post, had reported on this incident, and um, this young man felt that he was reported on very unfairly, that he was um, called a racist, that he was accused of things he didn't do, et cetera, et cetera. And so he decided to sue the Washington Post, among many other organizations, he sued the Washington Post for $250 million. That suit was initially thrown out by a judge who said that um, his claims of being called a racist and um, engaging in racist conduct were not supported by the plain language reported in the Washington Post article. His lawyer came back with a revised complaint that was slightly scaled back and it was, it was allowed to go ahead in court. Um, he also sued CNN, NBC Universal, and several other public figures for smaller amounts. They reached a settlement out of court, and the Washington Post did not admit any wrongdoing in that settlement. Um, this young man went on to speak at the Na Republican National Convention this year, and he's been hired by Mitch McConnell's re-election campaign. So one can imagine he's um, set himself up for um, some interesting jobs very young in his life. He was a high school student when this happened just a couple of years ago. Um, so he sued the Washington Post, that case was thrown out, it was reinstated with a reduced, a slightly scaled back complaint, and it was settled out of court. Um, I'll explain a little more about that in a minute. Another example um, that was, the question asked about was Representative Nunes, he is a California representative, and he has a long history of suing media outlets that he doesn't like. So for example, he sued Twitter over this, the Devin Nunes' cow parody account. Devin Nunes' cow was making fun of Mr. Nunes and his claim to be a dairy farmer. Um, and he is a dairy, he does own a dairy farm, but it's more complicated than that. And uh, this, this account has gone on to, um, you know, provide a lot of commentary about his work as a, as a national uh, representative. Um, he has, Mr. Nunes has also sued Hearst magazines over reporting about his dairy farm and McClatchy, which is a newspaper conglomerate, over reporting about a party that was hosted by a winery that Mr. Nunes partially owns. So um, he has a history of filing these lawsuits in Virginia, which is a particularly friendly um, jurisdiction for libel lawsuits. It's uh, there are anti slap laws, which are um, strategic lawsuit against public participation laws in Virginia are much weaker than in other places. So even though this is a California representative and he was suing um, a newspaper, uh, the, the uh, I think it was the Fresno Bee that he was suing directly. Um, so a California newspaper, he filed the suit in Virginia. Um, 
So that's just the background, but just to let you know, the, the issue at hand is that Mr. Nunes is also suing CNN because CNN reported that Mr. Nunes met with a Ukrainian official um, in order to dig up dirt on Joe Biden and Joe Biden's son. And Mr. Nunes has denied that that is true. He has provided a little bit of evidence, but not clear evidence that he never had that meeting. Um, and so he has sued CNN. This is getting longer than I thought it would be. Um, whoops. Yeah. Um, so I wanna talk about why you can't really sue Twitter. Um, Mr. Nunes's lawsuits and Mr. Sandman's lawsuits against Twitter didn't go anywhere. And the reason is the Communication Decency Act has a section number 230. It says no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. In real language, what that means is Twitter can't be sued for what people say on Twitter. Twitter can only be sued because of some changes in that law um, if, they if they do not take action to stop illegal activity surrounding sex trafficking. That's pretty much one of the only things that you can sue a platform for is if they're not taking significant actions to stem that, that as an issue on their platform. But otherwise you just can't sue Twitter because somebody said something on Twitter that you don't like. Um, so the 26, this section 230 is kind of known as the 26 words that created the internet. Um, because if it weren't for that provision, we wouldn't have social media because there's no company in the world that would be willing to take the risk to let users say whatever they want if they then could be sued for those words. So takeaways from these examples, um, no, the mainstream media are not perfect. They did some very inaccurate, well, I would say at least somewhat inaccurate reporting about that Sandman incident um, with the Native American in Washington, DC. Um, sometimes you will find more egregious examples, undisclosed relationships or insider trading. There was a case of one Washington Post reporter named Jay Solomon who was fired after it was disclosed that he was reporting about uh, a, a businessman and it later turns out that he had direct business ties to that businessman and the businessman was known to ferry weapons for the CIA. So um, yeah, things can happen. Nobody is perfect and the mainstream media are certainly not. You always need to have your blinders off no matter what news source you're, you're listening to. Um, but there is still a big difference between uh, investigative journalism and citizen journalism and that is that um, the example I just told you about, Jay Solomon, he lost his job. He did, he did get fired for his inappropriate behavior and it violated the Washington Post's conduct policies and um, ethics policies. So um, that accountability is one of the big differences as opposed to bloggers who wouldn't lose their job if they had reported inaccurately on this. Um, number two is suing someone is not proof of their guilt. So the Washington Post settled its lawsuit with Nick Sandman. Um, but they did, they specifically did not admit wrongdoing in that settlement. We don't know what the amount of that settlement was, but we do know that defending libel lawsuits is extraordinarily expensive. And it is usually the best business decision to settle them out of court whenever possible. Well, maybe not whenever possible, but it is often the better dis business decision to settle. So just because someone has sued someone, just because Representative Nunes sues Twitter over the Devin Nunes cow account doesn't mean that Twitter was in the wrong for hosting that account. Um, just because Representative uh, Nunes has sued CNN for its reporting about a, an alleged trip to uh, meet with Ukrainian officials does not mean that that reporting is false. That suit is still in the courts. I don't see that it, there's been any resolution to it one way or another. CNN is standing behind its story. So the fact that a lawsuit exists doesn't necessarily mean that the, the news organization was in the wrong. And it is true though that mainstream media can serve to disseminate fake news. So it did inaccurate reporting about the Sandman incident in the first place. Um, later videos came out to show more context. That's true of a lot of things. The initial facts of, an, of a situation don't tell the whole story. So um, they do sometimes get it wrong. The other thing is though, that mainstream media can disseminate fake news simply by reporting on it. And Pizzagate is one of those examples. Pizzagate was not a story, but it became so talked about on the internet that mainstream media felt the need to talk about it and debunk it. 
But we know, and we'll talk a little bit later about how the fact that if you hear something multiple times, you're going to be more likely to believe it, whether it's true or not. Sometimes the act of fact checking and talking about fake news can actually generate more belief in that news. So that was a long sidetrack. I wanna get back onto the regular scheduled program for today, but I do appreciate those questions because I think they're really good ones. Um, you know, there, there is no question that mainstream media does not always get it right. But some of the things we talked about last week, including those ethics policies um, and the, the professional standards of professional journalists do help to ensure that things stay more on track. And the, the legal justice system, of course, also helps with that. And civil lawsuits help with that too. So um, let's talk a little bit today about the psychology of misinformation. Some of this was in the readings that I recommended for you last week. Um, so how is our psychology working against us? We know that our brains don't always have our best interests in mind, even though um, they think they do. So let's talk about some cognitive biases. These are a collection of faulty ways of thinking that are hardwired into the human brain. We all have these. Um, they are a product of evolutionary survival. We, um, we just take in too much information. There is no way that our brains can process every single bit of sensory information coming into our heads. Even right now, as we're just sitting at our desk, there are so many things to see, things to hear, things to touch, things to smell, whatever. You can't process them, them all. So your brain needs some shortcuts. Um, and these cognitive biases tend to be those shortcuts, making assumptions about the world based on your past experience and based on the way your brain functions. These are actually really fascinating. If you are interested in the topic, I suggest you look up Wikipedia's list of cognitive biases because there are a lot of fun ones. So some you'll see in everyday life, like the gambler's fallacy. If you flip a coin five times and it's come up heads every time, what's the chance on that sixth time that it's gonna come up tails? And your brain says, oh, really high, it can't be another heads, but actually the chance is 50-50, just like it was for every other one of those flips. Um, and that's why gamblers still sit at those um, slot machines. The sunk cost fallacy, I've already spent $2,000 on this car and now this other thing broke. I gotta put in another thousand to get it fixed. But if you stop and actually analyze the situation, your car may not be worth that extra thousand dollars. So that's the sunk cost fallacy. Um, one of my favorites on that list is the Ikea effect. That is the tendency for humans to place a higher value on something because we assembled it ourselves, regardless of the actual quality of the product. So um, your Ikea desk may look really great to you because you put it together, but not to somebody else. And one that I have run into in my own family, the endowment effect. The endowment effect is the tendency for people to ask more to give up something than they would be willing to pay for it. In other words, people place a higher value on something that they own than something that someone else owns. And I see this all the time with my aunts going through family relics. Oh, this old thing has got to be worth at least $1,000. And you look it up and no, it's really not. Um, so think about what you're leaving behind to your kids. Anyway, so those are just some fun ones. But let's talk about some that really have more rel um, relevance when we're talking about information literacy. And the first one is one um, that is really important, and that is confirmation bias. That's the tendency that we have to interpret new evidence as confirmation of our existing beliefs. So you're gonna see this in online debates a lot. If someone asks you to back something up, you don't go out looking for um, arguments on both sides or evidence on both sides in an argument. You go out specifically looking for information that supports the belief you already hold. And you're going into the situation prepared to support that belief and defend that belief, not with an open mind and the willingness to change that belief if you're given evidence to the contrary. Um, just because you find a lot of information that supports your belief doesn't necessarily mean it's true. Really, um, the best you can actually logically hope to do is disprove something by finding evidence that it's not true. A lot of examples of something being true isn't necessarily, um, you know, make it a rule. But anyway, this is, this is sort of our tendency to go into a situation saying, I already know the answer. Let me go dig up some articles that can show you that I know the answer. The illusory truth effect is also, uh, is the tendency to believe false information to be correct after repeated exposure. So that's what I hinted at a few minutes ago when I talked about news media um, helping disseminate fake news. If you see something a lot of times, you are more likely to believe it. Even when the context that you've seen it in is fact-checking, 
even when the context that you've seen it in is somebody else debunking the idea, simply having seen it before makes you more receptive to it again when you see it again in the future. This is a real problem when you're trying to challenge fake news online. If that fake news has gotten a lot of press, like Pizzagate, people are more likely to believe it. And you can offer them evidence that it's not true, but they still already have that confirmation bias going. They're still looking for evidence that it is true because they already believe that it's true. And they will discount evidence that proves that it's not. So the illusory truth effect is why trolls and bots, which we're gonna talk about in a couple minutes, really have a huge effect on online discourse. Um, and you know, remember that the illusory truth effect, this is basically what advertisers have always done. If you put the word Coca-Cola in front of people's faces enough times, people will start to believe that Coca-Cola is the right choice. It is the best one, right? Um, that's, that's what advertisers do, and that's what information um, and fake news, have, the information and fake news have the same effect on you. You see it a lot of times, you start to believe that it's the right choice. Um, and this is why fake news circulating on social media can be so insidious. <clears throat> In-group bias, tendency to give people preferential treatment if they belong to the same group that you do. So you're going to believe evidence from somebody on the same side of the political spectrum as you over evidence provided to you by somebody on the other side of that spectrum. Um, because why? They're more believable to you. You know them. They're just like you. You can relate to them. Um, so it, it results in kindness or favoritism to people in our group, and it can result in harm or, or disfavorable actions towards people outside our group. So um, that's why people call fake news when they hear someone on the opposite side of a debate talk about an idea they don't agree with. It's, I don't believe you because you're not part of my group. Um, okay, so proportionality bias. This is one that... Um, relates to conspiracy theories, we tend to want to believe that big things have big causes. So we don't want to believe that the world is falling apart just because it's a random sequence of events. We want to believe there's some meaning behind it. Um, the bigger the event, the bigger the theory behind it. So this is um, one, of those, one of those explanations for why we may be more susceptible to conspiracy theories. The Dunning-Kruger effect isn't more important than the other ones, but I like this graphic, so I wanted to give it a whole page so you could see it better. Um, and this is named after the re some researchers who identified it, um, uh, David Dunning and Justin Kruger. And it is basically the, the idea that people who don't know things are much more confident in talking about them than people who are experts in the subject. So uh, if you look at this graph going across the bottom, going from, from you know nothing to it to you are a guru about it, way down here in this know nothing is the peak of Mount Stupid. This is where you're going to see a lot of online commentators. They know just a tiny bit about something and suddenly they are an expert and they want to talk about it. The fact is, if you don't know anything about a subject, you don't know what you don't know. If you are really uneducated about something, you just don't, you are not aware of all the factors, you're not aware of all the issues, you're not aware of all the effects that things have. And um, so something may seem cut and dried to you, but somebody who's studied the issue a lot more, they go through this valley of despair. There's so much going on here, I will never understand it. And they talk much less confidently online or in, or in real life about something. And then they slowly move up this slope of enlightenment, enlightenment until the point where they could become a true expert. And so you can sort of imagine, you know, the kinds of people going from your random internet troll commenter on the peak of Mount Stupid up to your um, seasoned researcher up at the plateau of sustainability who really understands an issue and is willing to talk about it confidently. But most of us are gonna lie somewhere in the middle in there. Um, and so uh, this is not a new idea. You see this quote from Yates from 1919. Um, some people credit Lao Tzu with saying, who knows most speaks less. It may or may not be an actual Lao Tzu quote. We think maybe it was written by an Italian in the 1600s. But the point is, this idea has been talked about for a long time. Those who know, who knows most speaks less. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. And then uh, the one that you guys read a cartoon about this week, the backfire effect. Um, so this is, I like this cartoon a lot. It came out in 2016, just after the, the presidential election here in the United States. Um, 
And so it talks about how we do have a tendency to sort of lock ourselves in and defend an idea. And this, this graphic sort of from the cartoon itself sort of encapsulates that by talking about how we've built up these little houses based on our upbringing, our tradition, our religion, our family, um, our experiences, our identity as a dog person, our hatred of cilantro, whatever the issue is, you build that as part of your identity and you are more willing to defend that and you are less likely to take action that steps you out of that identity. Um, it's related to an idea called identity-based motivation um, and which is related to things like, um, you know, first time college students uh, in, in, in a family. If they don't see themselves as people who attend college, if they don't see their family as people who attend college, it makes it much more difficult to take the steps towards making that goal happen. Um, so it's, it's sort of encapsulating your identity, your defense of an idea, your cognitive bias towards believing that, that already held belief. Um, and the idea behind the backfire effect is that by challenging someone on those beliefs, they just build another fence. They put up the wire higher, they, they dig in their heels and they defend it just to the death. Um, the more research people do about this, the more they realize that they don't think it actually is true. Um, the backfire effect does happen, especially in superficial conversations. So debates online in the comment section of Facebook or YouTube, you're gonna see a lot of backfire effect. But in real life, it's actually been demonstrated that this isn't as strong an effect as we thought it was. Um, it's kind of rare, in fact, and it shows up more in, in studies where case sizes are, are smaller. So um, once you start to collect a lot of data on this, you realize that it may not be as big of a trend as you thought. It's less likely to happen where, um, where the facts are clearly known. It's more likely to happen when facts are ambiguous. So when you're really debating opinion, as opposed to fact, you're going to see some more backfire effect. Um, so I put a link on here and, and like last week, I will share this slide deck with you so you can click any of these links if you want to follow up. Um, but there is a link on here showing you how the backfire effect is mostly a myth. So I want to do take a little break here and talk and do a little bit of discussion time. So we read quite a few things about conspiracy theorists and and the um, psychology that goes into those. I'd like to hear your impressions or thoughts about any of those readings or any of the things I've talked about so far today. Okay, I um, I watched the TED talk about um, the information we get, and I realized that a lot of the people who are have opposite views from me and express them on Facebook, it's be, it's probably at least partly because that's the information they get, you know, when they go on Google News or or whatever, and. Um, also, he made the point that that's <laughs> eroding our democracy because we don't all get the same information. Yeah, that video is about um, nine years old now, Eli Pariser's TED Talk about filter bubbles. Um, but it's still really talked about a lot. Um, technology has changed slightly. So filter bubbles actually are less of an issue with Google, but they are more of an issue with social media than they used to be. And of course, social media has taken such an outsized role in a lot of people's lives and their news consumption. Um, so it's even though that video is getting a little older, it's still really worth reading and, and or watching and thinking about because you're right, um, people are not getting the same stuff online. They're not seeing the same information. I very honestly did not read all the articles. I've been packing probably a hundred boxes and moving them and it's not much fun. Doesn't leave much time because I kind of collapse in bed every night. <laughs> <laughs> you mean these articles aren't keeping you up at night reading them? You take you to bed and just stay up? So very sorry, <laughs> but I find it's it all okay. very interesting. Um, okay. I just wanted to make a comment on, I think your Dunning 
Kruger event, my mom used to say, empty cans rattle. <laughs> That's a very good way to put it. <clears throat> Um, I don't know if it was um, in your readings or not, um, but some I was surprised at uh, a few things that I read over the past week, and one was on the percent of um, news that is obtained through social media, and mm -hmm. and I guess that surprises me because, well, maybe I don't do social media that much, but I where is that all coming from? I mean, are you talking about things, just little blurbs that pe people pass on from one person to another? Um, that type of thing? Yeah. yeah, that's a lot of it. Um, so people who use social media get a lot of news sort of incidentally. If you ask someone, are you going to Facebook to get news? They'd probably say no, or most people would. But um, as you're scrolling through Facebook or Twitter or whatever, you're getting a lot of headlines, you're getting a lot of news that's shared by other people, that's shared by pages that you follow, and that sort of pops up, well, there's a lot of advertising as well, so it's, it shows up as sponsored posts or advertisements. Um, and then, you're, so you're getting it kind of incidentally, you're getting what other people are talking about, and it's not clear when, as a user, why you're getting what you get. So Facebook's algorithm and Twitter's algorithm, those are all secret, like proprietary computer programs, you don't really know what goes into deciding what it feeds you. Um, so yeah, a lot of that social media news consumption isn't intentional. It's not people saying, I'm gonna go to you know, Instagram and see what happened in the headlines today, but it's people, other people who are using Instagram talking about things that they saw or sharing things that their friends have shared. Um, well, you can, you can subscribe to many news media outputs, right? Yep, you sure can. So on Facebook, they're called pages. On other media, they're called other things. But yeah, um, all the news organizations have active Facebook presences on all the platforms, including TikTok um, and the other random teenager sites. Um, so yeah, they're all out there sharing things. And all it really takes is for one friend to like something or share it or comment on it for you to then see it in your newsfeed as well, whether even if it's something that you haven't followed, all page posts are public. So you won't see, like if, if you're not my friend on Facebook, you won't see my posts. But if I comment on CNN and I am your friend, you're gonna see CNN's post because CNN stuff is public. And so is you know WAPOs and Wall Street Journal and all the other ones. Um, so yeah, those things circulate whether you have asked for them or not. And if you have followed specific media organizations, you're, you're going to see those more often too. Not all the time. Facebook will look at what you've interacted with in the past and feed you more of the same stuff, which is that one of those ideas of the filter bubble. We'll talk a little more in detail about that later in the class. Teresa, I wanted to mention um, something that came to my mind when I was reading the stuff about the conspiracy theory is the human need to um, have, you know, they, they talk about ha having to have a cause for whatever the effect was. And, um, and I, I think that there's a lot of tendency that we need someone to blame or we need a scapegoat. And mm -hmm. it came to my mind when I was a, in eighth grade, my friends and I were having a pajama party and we were walking down the street at about 11 p.m. and a drunk fellow came by and rolled his car right by where we were. Uh, and of course, all the neighbors came out. And um, I remember them saying that those girls must have caused this accident. <laughs> and I was, you know, kind of upset because of course we weren't. Uh, but that need to blame, we have to have a cause and we have to find someone to blame. It's a really human need to, um, to have explanation, whether it's cause or, you know, credit. So we want there to be reasons behind things. We don't want to live in a, in a world that's random and unpredictable. So that's kind of the foundation of like everything humans do really. So science is all about finding explanations. Religion is about finding meaning. Um, all these things that are so important to our lives really come back to, in a lot of cases to what's the meaning behind this? 
Did it just happen randomly or is there some larger picture? It's disconcerting to think that, you know, a drunk guy can just roll his car in front of you for no particular reason at all. And, and you know, hopefully you guys were a few steps back and didn't get injured, but what if you'd been a few steps forward? Would that have been, would, would there have been a reason behind it? Who knows? One of the things that I'm finding disconcerting is that for whatever reason, we're all under so much stress, whether it's COVID, politics, family life, or all of the above, many people are deliberately avoiding the news. And I've, I've seen it all the time, people saying, just don't watch the news. You don't need to know it. And many of them are believing that it's all fake. And it's almost like, you know, I've had people say to me, just turn off the news and quit believing. And some of this is factual stuff we're talking about. And it's just very concerning at how many people that I know that are really intelligent, good people that are choosing to not gather facts. They're just taking verbatim what someone tells them and just that that's the way it is. Yeah, I am. Um, I see that a lot too. And you're right, it is kind of disconcerting because the fact is you can't escape all the news. You're gonna hear about stuff. If you hear about it from a news organization or you hear about it on TV or you hear about it from your neighbor or you see the headlines as you're walking through the grocery store and the newspapers are laying there, you're still gonna hear about stuff. So it is a good coping mechanism to turn things off once in a while and live in the real world and, and you know, try to focus on different issues. But if you don't, actively look at the news with a critical eye, you're going to be subject to whatever happens to fall in your way. So that might be just whatever person is, you know, closest to you or whatever community idea is out there. If you live in a, in a polarized community, you're going to see one idea or another. Um, so it can be problematic. You know, I totally get that instinct though, to just want to turn it off and, and take a break and you know, let your brain rest. And you need to find that balance, but I agree with you. I think it's problematic to just think that you could escape all of it. It seems to me that there needs to be kind of a, a service that kind of takes both sides of the slant and, and says, okay, um, okay, for example, um, CNN pre presented these facts, Fox News presented these facts on the same side um, and then let you make your decision on what it is because um, taking this Sandman case that you mentioned, um, they sh may talk about, uh, CNN may present the one side of the facts and, but if you listen to Fox News, you wouldn't hear that at all. You just hear the other side. And it's like you're getting two different, completely different stories depending on your news source and there needs to, and even some of the ones that are more in the middle, um, still slanted slightly one way or the other and you don't really get both sides. And so it gets very frustrating to, um, to listen um, to either side because um, if you were listening to something else, it'd be like an entirely different um, reality. I'd like to uh, mention a uh, book that, oh, sorry. No, I'm on. Oh, we can hear you. Yeah. I, I'd like to mention a book. Uh, my brother sent me a book called The Righteous Mind. And I've just now started reading it, but it, I'm very excited about it and I'm excited to get into it, but it's, it's really challenging me about, you know, the fact that we all have a righteous mind. And how many of my friends and I have said to each other, I can't believe how those other people could do that or how they could buy that or how they could feel that way. Um, and it's such a strong tendency. And I really think it's hard to go be outside of yourself and, um, and be critical of everything or look at everything you know first of all you can't look at everything because there's too much of everything but i i'm excited about that book and 
we should maybe um, have a discussion of it. But I think it would have to be more than one uh, episode, uh, Teresa, because it's a big, thick book. Yeah. Who's the author? I would have to look at, I would have to get the book. I will get it while we're doing our class. So I want to just push back on the idea that Macy shared about, um, you know, seeing both sides of the issue. And I, I, you know, that's, it's a really valid point. You do need to look at multiple views on something if you want to really form an unbiased opinion. Uh, and there are services that try to do that. News aggregators try to do that, although many of them then use algorithms to keep feeding you news that you like. So then it starts to, over time to shift away from that sort of neutral view. The downside of that, and I want to give a sort of extreme example, is um, when you're focused really on providing both sides of an issue, um, you can actually distort the issue. And an example of that is mainstream media's sort of bending over backwards for the last couple of decades to provide both sides of the issue whenever they did a climate change story. Um, in reality, something like 99% of scientists have a consensus about the fact that climate change is human driven and um, they have a, a general understanding of how it's working and how it's affecting the world. There are of course differences of opinions on issues and on specific sort of cause effect scenarios, but overall scientists agree that climate change is real, it's human caused and we know what's causing it. But for many, 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 many years, the media would put on someone talking about a climate change issue and then they would give equal airtime to a climate change denier. And it changed the picture that we have over that debate. It made us believe that there was a debate when in the world of science, there really has not been a debate for a long time. There was a debate at first, there was a debate for many years, but the consensus around those ideas has solidified a lot longer than public consensus has. And I believe that this media, you know, sort of, really strong effort to show both sides of an issue when those both sides were not actually equal in terms of their scientific backing changed the way we understand that issue as a, as a, as a whole, as society. So you do need to be cautious about that um, sort of perception of neutrality. Is it really providing neutral um, reality or is it actually providing just two opposing views for the sake of providing two opposing views? And that's complicated. There's no one answer to that. I think that's issue, issue. I think that's really relevant right now with all the Black Lives Matter. Uh, there's, you know, they're tending to report every little, well, I shouldn't say little, not little. Um, it's, it's heavy. It's heavy in one uh, form, one point of view. And, you know, I'm sure there's going to be a swing in the other direction and we're going to get the repercussions from that um, at some point here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's easy to tell the story of, you know, uh, a building burned because it's news, line, news headlines, right? It's a great visual. It's, it's a dramatic issue. There's a business owner that lost their livelihood. Um, it's not maybe as much fun to talk about the thousand people who stood on the side of the road with a sign in their hand, right? Um, yeah. And I'm not saying that, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to put my own political views on this, but you're, I, I guess I'm just trying to reinforce your point in that sensationalism uh, can also affect this. What is, what is newsworthy is what drives eyeballs to your screen, right? It's not necessarily what's reality. So one bad actor may be more newsworthy in the eyes of a, of a newsroom than a thousand good actors. Yeah, and I think a lot has to do with personality of the individual too. Um, certain personalities tend to view things in certain ways mm -hmm. and others see it differently. Okay, I got to move on because I still have actually a lot to cover in today's presentation. So um, I want to make sure you have at least some introduction to some of these other ideas, but this has been a good discussion so far. Okay, so let's talk for a little bit about bots, trolls, and imposters um, and the other ways that your newsfeed gets distorted. So we talked about the psychology a little bit of why people want to share things, why people want to believe things. Uh, let's talk again a little bit about how your, how your feeds are being manipulated for you. Um, so imposters are pretty straightforward, <laughs> that's not the right word, uh, but it's a pretty easy idea to understand. It's someone pretending to be someone they're not. 
So here's an example I saw a lot this summer of people sharing these Jayco ads. We're going to give away this RV. For some reason, RVs were big, maybe because I had shopped for an RV earlier this summer. Um, and so I got all those. But, you know, we're going to give these away. Well, this luxury RV is not actually a real company. They don't have 150 RVs that have to be sold just because their seals were broken. Um, so this one's just pretty much a straight up scam and you'll see others like that. Um, so this is a Facebook header from World, Walt Disney World Travel, not an official page. Here's the official Walt Disney World page. Um, see that little blue check next to the word Walt Disney World? That is showing you that this is a verified page. Walt Disney World Travel is somebody else pretending to be Walt Disney World. And you'll see this a lot with slight differences in the name. Sometimes there'll be slight differences, like there'll be a period or some kind of punctuation in the fake one when there's not in the real one. But it's subtle changes. So these are just kind of, you know, scammy, trying to drive advertising dollars. Maybe they're true scammers that are trying to get your personal information for some reason. Um, but some of these change political discourse. So here's one um, purporting to be Rashida Tlaib, making kind of an inflammatory statement about sort of retaliation for treatment of Muslims. This is not a real account. If you were able to read computer speak, you would see that that name is Rashida T, the number one AIB. Instead of an L, it's the number one, but because of the font that Twitter used, it looks like an L. And that's how they were able to create that account. She responded um, with this tweet, pointing out the fact that she has the verified account, the other one is fake. She of course reported it to Twitter, it was later deleted. But this tweet the, from the fake account made the rounds quite a bit before that account got deleted. So that impression was already out there that this woman is a radical Muslim, she is out for revenge, whatever the issue is. She of course is um, a, a representative from the state of Michigan. She's a member of what they call the squad of these freshman representatives in Congress. Um, and she already is the target of a lot of vitriol and um, harassment online. So this was just another example of that. So you really have to be paying attention to know that what that blue check means. Um, and not everybody who's real in the real world can get that blue check. So I can't. I'm not a public official. I'm not a publicly recognized person. There's not much um, incentive for someone to impersonate me online and therefore Twitter's not going to be bothered to verify my account. Similarly, my library cannot get, be, cannot get verified on Facebook because we're not considered big enough. So um, you can't always look for the blue check, but when you're talking about major political figures, the blue check, that verified status is one way to tell. So imposters are out there and they, they can have some effects as we just saw, but trolls are the ones that are really out there in numbers. Um, when we first started talking about trolls in the early days of the internet, these were just people who were obnoxious online. They just joined discussion groups and they followed pages and commented just to be annoying, just to make people angry. And so we started calling them trolls as a disparaging term. They would post inflammatory things, off topic things, um, there are people who are known as concern trolls who pretend to be concerned for you or concerned about the same issues that you are, but really are just spreading misinformation and uncertainty. Um, and trolls can be harassing and intimidating and they can dox people. Doxing is where you um, uh, are angry at someone for something they did on the internet. And so you dig up their personal contact information and you share it on the internet with the idea of making them feel intimidated or putting their personal safety at risk. So here's this woman's address. Why don't you go tell her what you think about what she said last week? That's what doxing is. Um, so that was sort of the original trolls. Nowadays, when we talk about trolls, we're more likely to be talking about people who are paid to be trolls. Um, their job is to push a message online. They create social media accounts under their own names or someone else's or fake accounts, and then they spread a message that is intentionally crafted to generate debate. It's intentionally crafted to um, make people believe that something is widely accepted information when it's actually not. These are also known as sock puppet armies because sock puppets are fake online accounts. Um, and they, they, one of the tactics, tactics that they use is what's called astroturfing which is where, you know what a grassroots movement is, it's people just of their own accord coming together around an issue and believing strongly in it and that becomes um, 
a, a topic of conversation. Astroturfing is, is that, but artificially generated. People are paid to come together around an issue that some corporation or government or whatever actor has decided that they want to spread. So how do these work? Well, a lot of them work out of troll farms. Um, basically, uh, well, the 50 Cent Army is an example. These are, it's not really an army, um, but it's a group of people thought to be paid by the People's Republic of China to spread messages in favor of the ruling Communist Party. So some people assume that when they're talking about China censoring the internet, that they're talking about um, removing posts that are um, that share ideas that the Communist Party doesn't like, but just as frequently, what China is doing is paying people to share pro-China messages, pro-Communist Party messages, um, patriotic messages around holidays or events, to give people the illusion that there are a lot of people online who love their country and who think China is going in the right direction and they just are really proud of it. Um, so one 2016 estimate, so that's four years old already, it's probably larger by now, um, showed 440 million fake posts per year from people paid by China to make them. Um, the Internet Research Agency is one that I mentioned last week. That's the one that was based in Russia, and it's funded primarily by a Russian, the Russian government or a Russian businessman. It's not quite clear. Um, and they basically spread fake information on the Internet using fake social media accounts. So they are, these, are, these were Russian people paid to create accounts and make posts all over the Internet about issues that Russia was concerned about. This is not just US elections. So Russia also had interests in uh, other places in the world. But um, you know, we, see, we saw those effects in the 2016 elections, so much so that um, several Russian officials were indicted by the Robert Mueller investigation over it. Um, the United States engaged in a cyber attack on the Internet Research Agency in 2018 with the approval of President Trump. Um, that did have an effect on them. The effect was kind of that they moved to Ghana and Nigeria. They are still out there. They are still active. They still have hundreds of accounts, if not more. Um, but they're just not acting in the same physical location as they were. So now they have um, usually young people paid to do these jobs. They're not paid a lot of money, but you know, when jobs are scarce, they don't have to be paid a lot of money. Um, and you know, there is there are clear reports that they are still trying to influence the United States election and other political elections and, and concerns around the world through these new facilities in Ghana and Nigeria. And I say facilities, that's overstating it. It's kind of like a house in the suburbs where a bunch of people sit around a dining room table with phones and work. Um, it's not elaborate. These do not require a big investment to set up. They just require a man on the ground to pay local people to do it. Turning Point Action is an Arizona-based political organization. Um, and it's, the, the Washington Post reported this summer that they've identified young people who are associated with Turning Point Action being paid to tweet and otherwise post on the internet on conservative issues. And there's nothing illegal about that. You can pay people to, to write journalism and you can pay people to write tweets, but it's not, they don't make it clear that they're being paid to do it. And they're sort of generating this artificial view that young people are in favor of these conservative ideas. Um, so not illegal, maybe problematic, certainly a disinformation campaign. Um, when someone's being paid to tweet about something, you know, I don't think you can take them at the same face value as if they were um, doing it for free. Although Turning Point Action's argument is these are young people who believe these things and we're just paying them, you know, to do it, but they would have done it anyway. And that's not an invalid argument. They might have done it anyway. There are plenty of young Republicans. Um, but so that that's an issue. Um, the Washington Post identified 4,500 tweets this summer with nearly identical content that all happened in a coordinated time frame. So that's how they started to become aware of this as a campaign is that these things are they're sharing documents with these kids online. They're using shared documents to get some of the content for their posts. They're encouraged to edit those posts just slightly to make it sound more like them or make it sound more authentic and then share them out. But they're doing so in a coordinated, in a coordinated way with coordinated timing to make it, um, again, generate this buzz online about something. <clears throat> um, so there's a really interesting thing called the Spot the Troll quiz. I really recommend you take some time to take it if you can. What it does is it shows you the social media profiles of the person and asks you, is this person real or are they a troll? 
And it's really hard. You cannot always tell. And the thing is, this is a good exercise to sort of prime your brain towards thinking about these trolls and thinking about whether accounts are real or not. In the real world, very few people would take the time to examine the profiles of every tweet they saw on Twitter or every post they saw on Facebook or comment they saw. Um, so in reality, people don't go through that kind of process when they're talking with someone online. But it is useful in terms of helping yourself identify how these things work. So do that if you can. Spottheetroll.org. Only takes a few minutes. It's like eight questions. It's like eight profiles that you look through. <coughs> so bots are similar to trolls in that their their real purpose is to generate this illusory truth effect again. This it, everyone is talking about it. It's a trending topic. It's at the top of Reddit. It's at the top of Twitter. It's you know it's everywhere you look. Here's this topic again. And a lot of this is being generated by bots. Bots are computer programs. They are not real people. So they are, that's how they're different than trolls. Trolls are real people that are paid to post these things. And that gives them sort of the nuance of actual conversation. Um, bots are computer programs. They're interacting. Uh, they're really in a, a strong actor on Twitter because Twitter has a great API application programming interface that allows programmers to interact with Twitter very easily. Um, and there are good bots. So um, the bot at New York Times first said, tweets whenever it finds a new word in the New York Times. And it's really fascinating to look at the changing language um, and new terms that are coming into use when they appear in the New York Times. There's one called um, at 100 zeros that tweets links to free books on Amazon. So that's useful if you're a Kindle reader. And there are bots that tweet weather and emergency information, all kinds of stuff, art. There are bots that generate artwork and then share it on Twitter. Um, so not all of these are evil, um, but some of them are designed mostly for plat platform manipulation. So a 2016 study at the University of Southern California said that up to 15% of Twitter accounts are bots, excuse me, 2017 study. In 2016, they determined that up to 20% of election related tweets during their study period were tweeted by bots. So that's a lot of volume of, of tweeting. This is really changing what you're seeing on Twitter. Um, in 2020, so just this year, Carnegie Mellon was studying the effect of bots on um, the coronavirus conversations, and they discovered that of the 50 influential retweeters, meaning people who just take a tweet and share it again, 82% um, of those were bots. And a lot of those were dominating these, stay, these challenges to stay-at-home orders, these reopen America campaigns. Um, and and these, this activity, this bot activity was highly coordinated to try to promote that topic to give you the illusion that a lot of people were talking about the fact that these closed, these um, nationwide restrictions on movement and so on were a problem and that they, we should be reopening America. And you view an issue differently if you think a lot of people believe it. If you think everyone on Twitter is talking about how these restrictions are stupid and we should just open back up again, that changes your view of it. Um, so if you don't know that a lot of these are actually just computer generated programs out there spitting out messages that somebody wants to promote, that changes how you view it. Now, if you're not a Twitter user, does this affect you? Yeah, it still kind of does because a lot of people are Twitter users and a lot of so and a lot of media companies are heavily active on Twitter. Authors and journalists are really, really active on Twitter. So when their views of the world are being changed, your views are later because you're watching their media, you're, you're watching their news, you're reading their books. Um, so it, it filters down even if you're not directly a Twitter user. Predictive analytics is an enormous field of study. <clears throat> it's used in all kinds of ways, um, insurance actuaries, financial traders and markets. Um, can't credit ratings are based on predictive analytics. What this does is it takes data and it uses that data, historical data, to predict future trends. So if I look at all the huge amounts of financial data about consumers, and then I compare your financial data to that huge amount of data, I can predict whether or not you're going to default on a loan, for example. So <clears throat> gigantic topic, really fascinating stuff, actually, um, for data scientists. But in the context of information literacy, what I want to talk about is an article that Macy brought to my attention that was just in the Atlantic this week. And I think I put it on the website as a resource for further study if you want. I recommend looking at it. It was really interesting. And it was about how predictive analytics is being used to write text. 
And you'll see this on your phone now. If you're, com if you're composing a text to someone, you notice how it gives you suggestions for the next words. And oftentimes those suggestions are exactly what you were going to say. And whoa, how creepy is that? That's what predictive analytics is doing. It takes computer generate a computer system, usually a some kind of machine learning system. It feeds in text, and then it lets that computer analyze that text and then generate new text based on trends that it saw in the existing text. So a journalist can feed it all of the articles that that person has written, and the computer can look and learn about that journalist's style and the kind of things they talk about and spit out a whole new article that sounds very convincingly like it was written by a human being. The reason this is an, a problem for information literacy is that this can be used to generate an infinite amount of misinformation with almost no effort. No one has to sit down and write this stuff. All you have to do is click a few buttons say to the computer algorithm, I want to write about climate change today. I want to write about uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. I want to write about um, fracking today, whatever the issue is. And you can tell it, I want to, you know, I, you can feed it past examples that are sharing the message you want and have it generate new text. And this is how some of these fake news sites that we talked about last week are generating their articles. There's no human being that wrote these things. They're plagiarizing other writers and they're using these predictive um, analytics techniques to generate artificial text. Um, <clears throat> so just because something is a long article online doesn't mean it's any better or worse than anything else. So I did, I will, if I haven't already, I'll put that link on the website of readings and um, it's in the Atlantic. It's called, in the future propaganda will be computer generated and it's really interesting. So let's talk about filter bubbles. Um, the other things that were happening are good things for you to be aware of, but there's not a lot you can do to control them. You can't cut down the number of bots on Twitter. You can report individual accounts if you suspect they're bots and so on, but that's small scale compared to the um, scale that those bots are working on. <clears throat> Excuse me for a second. <clears throat> but your filter bubble is something that you can actually change a little bit. Uh, if you are intentional about it and if you know about it and know how to combat it. Um, so if you watched the do Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma, or if you watched Eli Pariser's TED Talk about filter bubbles, you know kind of what I'm talking about. This is the idea that, um, that media uses algorithms to feed you new information based on the stuff that you've looked at in the past. So um, it used to be much more pronounced on Google search results where, you know, Google sort of had a little profile of you based on where you live and what kind of things you've clicked on. And it sort of would know, do you want, you know, liberal or conservative results? Do you want, uh, if, if you've been so shopping for sofas all this time, so maybe now you want some area rugs or whatever. Um, it uses those algorithms to sort of predict what you're going to like and serve those up higher in the search results. That's less of an effect on Google than it used to be because Google had become aware of it and really not, and it sort of changed the way it did its algorithms a little bit. It's still an effect though. But where you see this more is um, on social media. So you're gonna get personalized ads now based on your profile. You're gonna see um, information from those public pages that you interact with more often, you're gonna see those more often. So you do kind of get stuck in this little loop of if I, if I only comment on NPR's news um, stories and I never comment on a Fox news story, Facebook's gonna feed me NPR more than they're gonna feed me Fox, right? Um, <clears throat> so YouTube recommendations are the same thing. If you use YouTube, YouTube is going to build a little profile based on what you've viewed in the past, and it's going to offer you more things like that. So if I'm using YouTube just for knitting videos, then I might get a little, you know, what to watch next recommendation about more knitting videos. But if I'm using it for political views or, or other kinds of topics, I'm going to get stuff that's in that bubble, stuff that's in that worldview, stuff that's related to what I've already watched. Um, so, you know, as Eli Pariser points out, the most important thing is you don't see what gets edited out. You can see what's left, but you don't know what was not given to you or what was not presented to you. So you're not seeing that other picture like at all. It's not that you're not choosing to click on it anymore. It's that it's just not there. And so you're actually seeing a different reality than other people. This is kind of what um, Wendy was hinting at a little bit earlier and some of, some of the others, um, filter bubbles, 
and echo chambers, which are sort of intentionally built. If you're hiding people that you disagree with on Facebook or you're unfriending them, and all you're keeping as friends are people who agree with you because it lowers your blood pressure, and that's a great you know, mental health tactic to try to keep yourself a little more sane, um, but you're building that echo chamber. And those filter bubbles and those echo chambers serve different realities to different people. It's easy to look and say, I don't understand what they're thinking. It is so obvious that the cause of X is Y. I have seen a million pieces of evidence this week that show that. So why does my friend think that the cause of X is Z? I just don't know what he's thinking. Well, the fact is you're not seeing the same reality that he is. You're not seeing the same stories. You're not seeing the same information. You might be seeing different bots because you're, diff you're following different things. You might be seeing just entirely different news feeds. Um, so you are not seeing what someone else sees. And that really is going into this polarization. And this is not just an online phenomenon. So don't think if you're not online much or you're not a social media user that you're immune to this. It's human nature to seek out what's familiar. It's human nature to not want to be challenged. We don't want to be always defensive. That's why we hide that annoying relative on Facebook, because we don't want to always be on the offensive. Um, but when you start to surround yourself with people or ideas that are not challenging, then you're changing your worldview. So you have to think about, even in the real world, who are you talking politics with? What church do you go to? What magazines and newspapers do you subscribe to? What does your community look like? So for example, if you live in a community like ours, which is almost entirely white, do you have the same perspective on racial issues as someone who lives in a diverse community or someone who lives in a community that is almost entirely black? You do not. So some of these things you can control and some of them you can't. Do you ever make an effort to try to control them? Do you reach out to people to talk politics on the other side of the aisle? I mean, I don't because I can't do it because it's we're so polarized, but that's not helping, is it? It's really contributing to the problem, but it's also not a problem I feel like I can solve on my own. Um, so filter bubbles and echo chambers are a real thing. They are not just a technology tool. They're not just an advertising tool. So um, in the world of social media or other online platforms, their, their goal is to keep you clicking, to keep you watching, to keep serving you ads. Um, but in the real world, your echo chamber that you've built is more likely, um, again, that, that feeling that we all want of safety and security, of explanation for the world, of reasons behind why things happen, and of not wanting to be always challenged. And so we seek out friends who have similar views to us. We, um, we tend to hang out with family members who agree with us and not hang out with the ones that don't. And on Facebook, that means we're friending those people and we're unfriending the other ones. Um, so we're building these, these echo chambers on our own. It's not all technology. The question is, how do you get around it? Um, and that's difficult. It is challenging on a personal level to try to seek out different views. You know, would you go to a different church to try to get a different perspective on things? I don't know. People, you know, they, they don't tend to do that, right? We tend to um, go to our church because that's our belief and that's where we belong and that's our community. And um, we don't tend to branch out in that way. Do I watch Fox News in order to get a, a, the other side of the story? Um, you know, I look at that media bias chart and I say, no, that's not a good choice, but would I read the Wall Street Journal? Yeah, I would. Um, would I read National Public Radio or listen to National Public Radio? Yeah, I would. You know, so I, you know, can you, can you choose things on opposite sides of that media bias chart to get another picture of what's going on? Um, you know, what do you subscribe to? So am I going to pay money to a newspaper that I hate to read it just to get a balance? I don't know. Am I? Uh, you know, we, we vote with our dollars. So we often say, you know, it's an act of, of social um, demonstration to choose to fund things that we approve and not fund things that we don't. And that means buying products from companies that we think are acting socially responsibly and not buying products from companies that we think are doing bad things in the world and, and all those things. So I'm not likely to pay money to a media organization that I hate, but maybe I could seek that out at the library or seek it out um, online on their free versions or something like that. So um, being conscious and aware of these things is the first step, but actually taking action to change them is difficult. And it's really difficult to be able to pick, um, in terms of news consumption, to be able to pick sources that will give you a good view of the world 
a balanced view of the world and not a partisan skewed view of the world in either direction. And that's where next week we're going to talk about um, identifying bad information. We're going to talk a, a little bit more about that media bias chart. And we're going to talk about some other tools that you can use to analyze the sources that you're looking at. So next week will be a little bit more sort of practical tools for, for looking at specific things that you are presented online or in the real world in terms of media and how you make judgments about its validity, its partisan skew, its, um, you know, its, its usefulness in your life sort of thing. So we'll look at, again, some of those skills that you need to identify fake news. We'll look at some fact checking tools. Um, we'll look at um, some techniques that you can encourage others to use to stop sharing some fake information, although that's really hard. And we will talk a little bit about how, whether it's even possible to get people to stop sharing misinformation, um, or more importantly, to stop believing misinformation. Um, and that's really difficult to do, but we'll look at some of the things that people are talking about around that issue. Um, so that's pretty much the end of my slides. Um, any more questions or comments or discussion about any of these topics? I have a question about the blue check that you talked about. Where, uh, is that just on Twitter, your Twitter account you're talking about the blue check or where do you see that? You'll see that on Facebook as well. You'll see it on Twitter. You'll see it on Instagram. Um, I think you'll see it on TikTok actually. But again, it's only for well-known individuals or organizations. So I can't get a blue check, but uh, Britney Spears could certainly get a blue check if she wanted one and she went through the process of getting one. It's a process. So somebody at, at Twitter or Facebook or whatever has to um, actually look at it. It's not an automatically generated thing. Um, so you will just see it from major companies or um, major public figures online on, on those kinds of social media accounts. That's a great take home point, Teresa. I did want to mention more about that book. The name of it is The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. And it's by Jonathan Haidt, uh, Haidt, I don't know how you say it, H-A-I-D-T. All I right, thank you. Good book to uh, follow up on this subject. I'm gonna Teresa, look and see I have if a question for you. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you're planning on covering it uh, in one of our next sessions, but it, it seems to me to be going along with what you're uh, pointing out to us here. Uh, the subject of polling or opinions. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm sure more, many people are in the same situation I'm in where your mailbox is full of uh, not only political, but uh, commercial stuff. Uh, you get stuff in the emails that, you know, if you bought something, you get uh, email and say, well, how did you like that product and all that. And that's shared with everybody, you know? Yep. And, uh, mm -hmm. and a lot of political stuff that's, of course, they ask you to send them money. Right. But uh, I, uh, I get stuff that I just knew it was just somebody sold my name an address to somebody else and it uh it it gets scary yeah so yeah I, I, either come at, go ahead. i was gonna say i, I was going to talk a little bit about like political polling next week just briefly um it, it's a big topic you know so that the idea that of trying to there are sort of two aspects of polling right genuine polling which is just we want to know where people, what people feel about an issue. And then there's sort of this, the political tool of polling, which is we want to know where people stand, but really we want to influence where people stand. You know, we, in, in human beings want to be part of a big group. They want to be part of that in group again, you know? So if everybody thinks candidate A is a great guy and everybody else I talk to thinks candidate B is a terrible guy, well, maybe I should look at candidate A a little sorry, you know? So there's, there's that sort of public influence portion of that as well as sort of the, um, you know, the journalistic reporting issue of where do people really stand. And polling is getting more complicated in, um, in the modern era because people don't answer their phones, or especially younger people don't answer their phones, and they don't even have landlines. So that's really changed 
um, the work of polling people and also the results of polls in terms of how valid they are to represent the whole public. Um, yeah, and so political advertising, like you mentioned, the stuff that you're getting in your um, in your mailbox, yeah, it's it's you know you used to think that stuff that came in the mail had to be true, right? Somebody printed it up and wrote it down and it's just not. I've gotten really terrible examples on both sides of the aisle already in my mailbox too. Um, and so some of that comes because, you know, when you're a registered voter, you, that information is public. Your, your address, your name and address is public. Um, some of it, like you said, one company will sell their list to another company. So you'll get on all these junk lists and that's how your cell phone ends up getting car warranty calls. Uh, eventually. So it's, it's a real issue and all this information coming at you all the time. Like, I can't answer my phone because it's probably another car warranty, but what if it's not? And I don't, you know, I just take all my mail and drop it right in the trash, but do I want to look at it before I do that? So there's all these choices you have to make all day long about what information you want to even respond to. So yeah, it's a big topic. Anybody else have comments or questions before we wrap this up for the week? I just wanted to say, uh, I think back to when my father was living and um, he and I were of not the same political persuasion and, and, but he religiously read everything that supported his view, all the printed material that supported his view. Um, and I think it's interesting how that has developed from the printed material now to this social media material. The difference is that the social media stuff is so much faster and so much more effective. Mm -hmm. It's so much easier to spread, right? When you got a newsletter from your favorite organization, you could maybe give it to a neighbor, but you wouldn't be able to share it with everybody that lives in your town within the next two hours. But you can do that on social media now, right? So it gets around a lot faster and things have a much deeper reach than they used to or they can. There's also a lot more out there, so there's a lot more to sort through. So you're not just getting a couple of newsletters a month from your organizations, you're getting, well, like Phil was saying, you're getting a mailbox full every day. The other point I'd like to make about that topic uh, of my father is, am I the same way? Just on the other side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the COVID of information. It's a pandemic. <laughs> okay, well, I've kept you over our hour again, but I appreciate you sticking with me. Um, and next week, we will talk a little bit about some of those um, more practical tools that you can use. The following week, what we're going to talk about is um, an issue that drives me a little bit crazy online, and that is people who tell me that I need to do my research. We're going to talk about what real research means. Um, what it means to do academic research, what that process looks like, and how that's different from just like watching YouTube videos about your favorite topic. Um, so you have a little bit of backup when, when you do run into those people who disagree with you on scientific issues and want to talk about um, their research or your research. So next week, practical tools for kind of everyday information evaluation, and then the following week we'll talk about that research process. And um, Again, if you have questions or comments or you come across some great things this week when you're doing your reading or just hearing from other people, share them with me. I got a lot of great things from you guys last week and I appreciate that. So thanks very much. Thanks, thanks Teresa. Teresa. Thanks, Teresa. Bye. 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 Bye.